Um, so I'm Andrew Perot. I'm a postdoc uh, here at the Center for Research on Computation and Society. Um, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Oren Etzioni uh, as the third speaker in our AI for Social Impact seminar series. Uh, he's the Chief Executive Officer at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Seattle, Washington, and has been professor at the University of Washington Department of Computer Science since 1991. Um, his awards include Seattle's Geek of the Year 2013, and he has founded or co-founded several companies, including Faircast, which is acquired by Microsoft. He's written over 100 technical papers, as well as commentary on AI for the New York Times, Wired, and Nature, and he helped to pioneer meta-search, online comparison shopping, machine reading, and open information extraction. Um, so please give him a warm virtual welcome. <laughs> Uh, Andrew, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Before I, uh, I shift to the slides, let me just say a couple of words. Uh, like, like Lily, I, I, I do kind of miss the uh, uh, informal feel of, of, of the audience and uh, interaction, but we will do, uh, we will do our best. Um, I spent some uh, formative years at Harvard, so I uh, can't wait to to come back and visit, but uh, that'll have to be uh, virtual, uh, obviously. And I'm really uh, excited about the mission of, uh, of your center, as you'll see in a second. Uh, Melind, who is a, uh, a friend and colleague, a co-student in grad school, uh, was telling me about it. It sounds incredibly, incredibly exciting. So with that, let's see if uh, I can successfully share my screen. Uh, and uh, this is actually uh, quite a new talk. So uh, uh, afterwards, please send me email. Uh, let me know if you catch any errors or things I should uh, improve. I tried to put together some uh, brand new content for this audience. So with that, um, uh oh, okay. Uh, let, let me show you the outline of the talk. I'm gonna start um, by talking about a very basic question. Is AI good or evil? Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, it's an issue that comes up again and again. I'll tell you a little bit about the Allen Institute for uh, AI. Uh, then I'll tell you a lot more about Semantic Scholar, our uh, free search engine that uh, for academic search that uses AI uh, to make academic literature search uh, a lot better. That led to uh, CORD19, a very special data set uh, corpus we created to uh, help in the fight against COVID-19. And I'll end with some uh, thoughts and speculations about AI and science uh, in the future. Uh, it's a lot, so we'll see, we'll see how far we get, or I'll skip some, some details as, uh, as needed. Let's do it. So th the first point is that uh, AI really uh, evokes fear in a lot of people's minds. And if you're an AI person, I'm sure you've encountered it from uh, family, friends, uh, et cetera. The people have a, fear, a fearful response. It's been, they've been conditioned by uh, movies like The Terminator and also by very prominent people like uh, Elon Musk saying things like, with AI, we're summoning the demon. And if you think this is just kind of uh, talk, well, um, he was uh, he met with the uh, with 50 governors and was arguing uh, for all kinds of restraints on AI. So this is very much not just uh, talk. And then in response, we have folks like uh, uh, Rod Brooks, for, formerly of uh, uh, MIT, who says, if you're worried about the Terminator, just keep the door closed. And look, eventually this robot using the miracle of machine learning will figure out how to open that door, but then he'll find there's a staircase. Right, and it can't go up the staircase. And when it goes up the staircase, there'll be many other challenges. So bottom line is we're still uh, quite a ways off from uh, the Hollywood notion of, uh, of intelligence. Um, still, people uh, continue to argue that we ought to really uh, worry about this. Uh, and very smart people like Nick Bostrom, Max, Max Tegmark, Stuart Russell from, uh, from Berkeley. And so quite recently, uh, earlier this year, I wrote a paper and said, let's stop arguing about this uh, philosophically. Let's stop arguing about intuitions. Are our intuitions that uh, omniscient AI is gonna be bad or good or uh, indifferent, right? It'll completely ignore us. I said, why don't we try to think about this in a more empirical way? Melinda and I uh, were educated at CMU where uh, Newell and Simon talked about uh, computer science, artificial intelligence as an empirical inquiry. And um, 
I said, how are we, we going to know uh, if uh, this uh, omniscient, omnipotent AI is around the corner? And I suggested that we think about what I called canaries in the coal mines of AI. And that is uh, certain uh, milestones or thresholds that if AI doesn't cross those, uh, we are nowhere near uh, what's called AGI, artificial general incentives. We, we can continue uh, to work on our AI research without worrying about this uh, apocalyptic vision. And so in the article, which I uh, encourage you to read, it's short and uh, non-technical, I talk about a number of things, but let me just quickly tell you about the biggest thing. The biggest thing is machine learning, right? So we think of machine learning as a hallmark of intelligence, a huge success for AI, but we often forget that machine learning is largely human intelligence, right? Who formulates the target concepts? Who uh, labels the data? who uh, defines the problem and formulates it in so many ways, uh, it's people. And then we have the machines do the last mile of learning, right? Once you have the labeled data, you run through it and you, you do some statistical computation to, uh, to find kind of a surface that separates the negative data from the positive data. And really, um, I argue that the term machine learning is really a, mis a misnomer. It should be called human learning with a little uh, mechanical twiggle, twiddle at the end. And the, the image I want you to have in mind is saying the machine learn, uh, machines learn, is really like saying the baby penguins fish, right? The uh, parent penguin goes out, identifies the tray, the, the prey, right, the fish, uh, captures it, even eats it, digests it, and brings it home, and then provides the baby with the pre-digested morsel that, it, that the baby eats. So um, uh, saying machines learn is like saying the baby penguins fish. Uh, the bottom line is AI is a tool. It's not a being, and it's up to us to employ this tool or set of tools uh, to benefit humanity. And that's the mission of the uh, Allen Institute for AI, or AI2 as we call ourselves. We're a nonprofit research institute founded in 2014 by uh, uh, Paul Allen. I've been leading the institute uh, since uh, its inception. And our foci have been, have been uh, computer vision, natural language processing, deep learning. At this point, we have over uh, 300 papers, uh, quite a bit more than that since the EMLP results came out, uh, 10 best paper awards. We have uh, 100 uh, plus uh, AI researchers, engineers, and, and staff. And most importantly, we're hiring. Uh, we have uh, summer interns, we have uh, research positions, uh, we have postdocs. We even have a pretty unique program that we call the uh, PYI, Predoctoral Young Investigator. So if you're an undergrad and you're not maybe ready for uh, grad school or you're not sure, but you wanna do research, uh, we have a special mentoring program uh, where you work closely with a, a research team and with a, a PhD level a mentor. And actually someone who you, you some of you might know, uh, Alexis Ross from Harvard uh, is, uh, is in this program right now. And people typically spend a year or two in this program and then go on to grad school. We have on our website, uh, list of uh, successful folks who got into CMU, Stanford, uh, UW, uh, you, you name it. So it's a, it's a very special program if you want to potentially go into research. Um, we have a number of projects uh, uh, at, at AI2, and I don't have time to go into all of them, so I'll just say kind of a line about each. About each. We have the Aristo project, which is about reasoning based on text and background knowledge. We have the LLP project, which is uh, cutting edge NLP research, the, and we've developed a uh, open source platform for NLP research based on uh, PyTorch that's uh, wi quite widely used. Of course, it's uh, free, has excellent tutorials if you want to come up to speed. We have a project called Mosaic that looks at the problem uh, of how do we endow uh, AI systems with common sense. Uh, I like to refer to common sense as the uh, dark matter of AI, right? It's kind of ineffable, uh, it's hard to measure, but at the same time, it's everywhere, right? How do you, uh, can you build an intelligent system, a truly intelligent system without common sense? Uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work on vision and interaction. That's in the uh, prior team. And I won't have much to say about that today, but there's some really uh, exciting work there. I'll mention we did build uh, a program that's uh, the first program to play Pictionary, 
So if you go to iconary.lnai.org, you'll see the first program that plays collaboratively with, with a person as opposed to against them, which you have in Go uh, and, uh, and chess and so on. And of course, uh, Pictionary, right? There's drawings, there's phrases. So we're using uh, a vision, language, and common sense. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So a lot of our demos are on our website. You can check them out. We also uh, realized that impact, positive impact in the world can come through uh, startups. So we also have our own uh, incubator uh, for startups the way many universities do. And uh, please, please check that out if you're interested. Uh, we have um, quite a number of startups. They're hiring. They're doing very cool things. Uh, the Semantic Scholar Project is, is probably our largest project. It is the largest project, uh, and it's a, a flagship project in terms of AI for the common good. So I'll spend more time uh, talking about that. And here, uh, the, the, the work here really starts with, uh, with the idea of um, uh, academic information overload, right? We're all subject to information overload with tweets and emails and Slack messages and uh, Spotify updates. Uh, but if you're an academic on top of all that, there's roughly uh, 8 new million papers per year. Scientists read maybe uh, 200 papers per year. And so what happens is the total number of papers is doubling every few years, but human attention is constant. Uh, we estimate that people read roughly 10,000 papers per their career. So, so you see the problem, right? We've got an exponential uh, curve meeting a linear one. And, uh, and that's a huge problem. And by the way, this is not a new insight. Uh, again, uh, Milin being here uh, reminds me of our grad school days. So Herb Simon uh, talked about this a lot uh, when he was around and emphasized that human attention is constant. So how do we solve this tension, this gap, uh, this information overload? Well, one answer is, is we can build better tools uh, to help people uh, cut through the clutter and home in on the key papers, uh, citations, and results. And so uh, putting our money where our mouth is, if you go to semanticscholar.org, you'll find our search engine. It's available 24-7. Uh, it's free. It's very widely used, not just in the US, but about half our traffic comes uh, from out of the country. It covers all academic disciplines, has about um, 8 million users uh, a month. And as I was saying, about half of those are from outside the US. And we cover on the order of uh, 190 uh, million papers. So quite, quite a large selection. Let me uh, describe to you what's involved briefly, and then I'll do a demo to try to make this again uh, as interactive as uh, possible. And this being Zoom, uh, I assume some of you are already on the website doing your own uh, self demo, which is, which is completely legitimate. So the basics of Semantic Scholar is to take PDFs uh, right, that, that uh, are meant to display papers and map those to a literature graph where the nodes in this graph are uh, authors, uh, papers, um, uh, venues, and the edges are, are uh, capture the relationship uh, between those. We also have a search engine which works on keywords and metadata. I'll show it to you. And we have on the order of 190 million uh, paper detail pages that, that gives you a snapshot of the paper. It automatically extracts the figures, the tables, the references of the paper. It automatically links to uh, GitHub repos. So the software that's in the paper, slide decks, uh, if we can find them, uh, videos of a talk about the paper, um, uh, blog posts about the work, um, uh, news, news articles, and we have uh, author homepages also, right, if you want to uh, perceive the information this way. Um, we innovated uh, quite a bit on uh, citation metrics. So the typical metric we're all familiar with is what we call raw citations, right, the, um, what you might see a Google Scholar or somewhere else, paper A, cite paper B. And we developed a more semantic notion of citations, and let me spend a few minutes on that. First of all, we exclude uh, self-citations, right? That's typically not very meaningful. And in fact, uh, it's also not gender neutral. Uh, we've done studies and other have, others have too that show that men tend to cite themselves uh, uh, more than women. So including self-citations is actually uh, sexist in a certain way. And we've shown that we exclude those. We also exclude incidental citations where you cite somebody, uh, a paper as a throwaway, 
uh, you know, out of politeness or for completeness, right? You cite it, but you don't really uh, talk about it in the paper. We do include uh, implicit citations. So for example, uh, again, Milind for many years worked on a famous system called SOAR. And maybe the first time SOAR is mentioned in a paper, it'll be cited. But then the other times they'll just mention the name SOAR. SOAR did this and this aspect of SOAR. So again, uh, we do include that when we analyze the paper. And lastly, uh, we rank um, the citations for a paper by the degree of influence of uh, paper A on paper B. And this will become clearer when I show you the demo. I have a, uh, a small note about this in uh, Nature. Uh, and we think that this uh, notion of citations is much better than raw citations. And one of the reasons it's better is that you only have to look at roughly, on average, 10% of the citations you'd have to look at if you're using uh, the standard measures. And we all know, right, you have a paper, uh, maybe it's cited, you know, you have a 2008 paper and maybe it's cited, cited a thousand times and then the papers that cited are cited, you know, 10,000 times and so on and so on. The transitive citation closure of a paper from 2008 is completely overwhelming. So if we can compress that by a factor of 10, uh, that's an important savings. Another thing we look at is what we call citation velocity. That's basically the number of citations per year for a paper, or even citation acceleration, the, the second derivative. And that's the change in citations per year. All right, uh, talk is cheap. Let's go to a, a demo and let's see if this still uh, uh, works. So can every, is everybody seeing the, no, I probably need to share my screen or something, right? Um, no, is everybody seeing the, um, Semantic Scholar homepage or not? No, we, I think we just see Semantic Scholar demo right now. Okay, let's, uh, let's do this share screen and we're gonna do this and then we'll share. How about that? Looks good. Okay, so this is gonna be our little demo. So I was gonna do uh, myself, but then I thought, um, you know, my papers are, are boring and so on. How about if we do Millend? Actually, let me, sorry, I'm gonna take this down so I can type better. Uh, let's see what we can find on Millend. So I haven't uh, spent a lot of time looking at this. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to Millend as an author. And so we have an author homepage for Millend. Uh, I see he's looking closely now. Uh, and so we, we see uh, his publications, he's only published 773 papers, it seems. Wow, uh, that's that's quite a lot. But uh, here, here's an example of these filters. So right now, uh, the papers are sorted by the most um, influential papers he's had. This paper has had 158 uh, highly influential citations. Uh, and we could um, uh, say, well, I just want ones where we have the PDF, or let, let's click on the paper and see what uh, what we learn about it. Uh, so here we have the top papers that cited it. It's from 2005. We might want to go to uh, more recent papers. If we scroll further down, we can quickly look at the figures and tables from this paper. These were automatically extracted. So I can uh, look at that, get a sense of, uh, you know, maybe the results, the pseudocode that's in there. That's, uh, that's very handy. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, uh, I can look at uh, related papers that are recommended by our uh, automatic algorithm uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. Or if I want to go back and say, well, gosh, I don't want his most influential paper. I want what's hot. How about uh, the papers that uh, have the most citations per year? And so uh, that's a paper on security and game theory um, uh, published in 2011. Or maybe uh, I want to look at uh, the one where citations are accelerating. So this one uh, is the citation rate is up 47%. And again, Milind, this uh, HK paper uh, uh, presumably means more to you than, uh, than, than to me right now, but it came out in HK. And again, I can click on it and uh, see uh, you know, some of the figures uh, and, uh, and so on. Let me just give you an example that I'm familiar with. We published a paper on uh, green AI uh, that, um, uh oh, uh, let, let me do it this way. Um, there's plenty of errors in, the, uh, in this data. So if I go to my homepage uh, and I say, let's sort by 
uh, the paper that uh, is accelerating. I come to the uh, Green AI paper. Again, it's open access, which, which is nice. Uh, when I click through, not only do I see the uh, citations and uh, things like that, but as you can see, uh, I have the code associated with that work. So uh, you can access that. I can click on paper mentions. This paper got a lot of uh, attention in the press because we were talking about how to cut the ca carbon footprint of AI. We have the New York Times, we have Analytics India Magazine, uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, things. So all this information, the figures, the um, the code, the um, uh, you know, sometimes there's videos and so on, all help you to decide. Hey, do I is this going to be one of the 200 or so papers that uh, that I read this year? So with that, let me uh, go back to my uh, presentation. Um, and uh, again, I could talk about features of Semantic Scholar until uh, uh, for a whole hour, but uh, uh, we, we, we don't have time for that. I want to make sure we get time for uh, questions and discussion. But um, so I, I just showed you a stream of features very quickly, and it's uh, not even necessarily easy to understand what's going on there. Uh, so I think it's worth taking a minute to just think of these features uh, um, in the context of how we uh, engage with scientific papers. And when I think about that, I think of three steps. First, we discover a paper, and that uh, can happen through social means. Maybe I hear about it on Twitter. Somebody emails it to me. Uh, it can happen uh, through search. I, I just quickly showed you our search engine, but it has a lot of uh, neat features or through browsing, right? I'm, I'm browsing the, uh, uh, some graph uh, or I'm browsing a conference proceedings. And uh, we uh, support paper discovery in Semantic Scholar through search, which uh, you can use our unique citation metrics and various filters like filter for open access, all through, also through recommendations like uh, related papers. Um, but uh, we also created a research feed the same way you have a Facebook feed or a Twitter feed. We actually uh, have a feed that's automatically uh, um, tailored to your taste or your interests um, as part of this. If you log in to Semantic Scholar with a few clicks, you can create a feed. Here's kind of a picture of it. And then you can rate papers more like this, uh, less like this, and get notifications about paper, papers that are particularly of interest to you. Now, currently it's focused on archive papers and it's definitely far from perfect, right? It's AI work in progress. At the same time, I think most of us, right, are completely overwhelmed by the number of papers that come out on archive every day. So an adaptive feed like that, uh, particularly after you, you uh, put on the order of 10 or so uh, likes or dislikes, will very quickly start to surface to you papers you could have easily uh, missed. So that's another useful thing. And, and, and think about all the work that's gone into product recommendations, right? Uh, and how little has gone into paper recommendations. So uh, we, feel, we feel good uh, about that. Once you've discovered a paper, the next step in the process is to decide, do I ignore it, right? That's most papers. Do I skim it? People uh, skim maybe uh, 10x or maybe even 100x more papers than, than they read. And we have various uh, features to support skimming. Or do you finally go ahead and um, uh, read, read the paper? Uh, to support reading decisions, we actually uh, have automatic highlighting turned on in various abstracts. So uh, if you click on a paper, you can see certain lines uh, highlighted. Um, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, the citations, as I mentioned, they're filtered, they're analyzed, and they're sorted by degree of influence. We don't just give you the citations. We give you citation excerpts. So if I see Milan's paper and I say, hey, do I really want to read this? Uh, it's from 2011. It's very influential. I can look at what people said about it. And that's often a very concise way to decide uh, whether to read it or not. So when we show you the citations, we show you who cited it. We also show you what they said about it. Uh, I did find it a little bit depressing when I looked at some of the citation excerpts for my papers because I found sometimes people cited, but they didn't actually read it, or if they read it, they didn't understand it. So uh, again, for those of us who've written uh, too many papers, sometimes it's an interesting trip down memory lane to see what people said about our papers. And then something that was just accepted into um, 
EM NLP, and uh, uh, so it's not even yet fielded on the site, but I wanted to show you is what we call TLDRs or extreme summarization. And so here's an example uh, on the left, and uh, this is work by uh, uh, Dan Weld and some colleagues from the uh, Semantic Scholar team. On the left, you see an abstract. Uh, and again, I won't ask you to read uh, all of it, but uh, often the abstract is quite long. So if we can boil it down to one or two sentences, uh, which we've done automatically here, we say basically this paper is about, we develop a new topological complexity measure for deep neural networks and demonstrate that it captures their salient properties. So that's obviously a cherry picked example, but as we see from uh, GPT-3 and other things, our ability to uh, use generative models to create um, highly informative text is really quite good. And in fact, the method here, without going into the details, is a generative language model tuned for uh, scientific summarization. If you want, again, the TLDR, think GPT-3 spitting out uh, one-line summaries of, uh, of papers. And um, so again, all helping you to make that big decision to read or not to read uh, this paper. And then lastly, once you've decided to read it, um, uh, then of course, there's the problem of understanding it, retaining that understanding, and eventually uh, citing it. And, uh, and we have some, uh, so, some, actually, let me just take a note here. Uh, um, we, we have some support for that uh, uh, as well. So moving, moving right along, I want to point out that, again, th there's a really important implication here for AI research and particularly for NLP uh, research. And that goes beyond these particular features that are useful and even beyond this model of how we help people engage in papers. And that is that we really need to scale uh, NLP from the current approach, which is focused on words and sentences to, um, to documents. And so traditional NLP, right, is focused on the distributional hypothesis, right, uh, cited by Harris 1956, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. In other words, our model of words really depends on their context, typically in a sentence or two. Uh, BERT, for example, a uh, very popular um, embedding system uh, that was actually based on the ELMO work uh, at AI2, I should point out. But anyway, uh, uses 512 tokens, uses a limited measure of context. Furthermore, if you pick up uh, in EMNLP proceedings, you'll see most of the work is at the sentence level. We're parsing sentences, syntactic parsing, semantic parsing. We're translating sentences. We're extracting information from sentences. Uh, the sentence is king, but the sentence is really a keyhole, right, uh, into, um, uh, into what, what we're doing here. And so uh, our work on uh, scientific NLP led us to think about document level NLP. We built a system called Longformer that allows you to think about words and sentences with a full document context. We scaled it from 512 tokens to 32,000, which uh, you know, covers uh, a typical paper and uh, requires you know, major technical innovation in uh, uh, transformers. We also look at hierarchy in a paper, right? A paper is not just a flat uh, sequence of words. There's sections and subsections. And uh, so uh, we, we look at that and we look at salience. Right. So, for example, if I do question answering, if you remember the squad data set, and again, if you don't know NLP, it doesn't matter, but the squad data set is about um, uh, paragraphs, question answering from paragraphs. But what if I want to answer the question based on an entire uh, scientific paper? It's a question related to COVID-19. Or what if I want to answer a question based on uh, the earnings report of a company or a memo, right? There's so many, or even a Shakespeare play. Um, so all these things uh, require us to do NLP at a, at a much higher level. Likewise, summarizing a document, multi-document summarization, multi-document uh, graph, literature graphs, all these things are part of uh, a document uh, level NLP and they're um, extremely, uh, extremely important. And that's where our research has, uh, has been going. So I'm excited that uh, the work on Semantic Scholar isn't just for the common good, uh, which it is, but it's then driven us to look at a new set of fundamental problems in natural language processing. 
uh, when we focus specifically on science, and there's more and more work on scientific NLP, we see that scientific documents have an additional special structure. First of all, if you see the um, uh, red there where it says related work, there's the um, uh, paper uh, sections that I mentioned. There's figures and tables, right? That's in green and yellow. And then, of course, there's citations and references. Uh, all these things are, are part of how you think about a paper. And we are using all elements of the structure to build a better understanding of really of what, what's called the uh, literature graph. Now, uh, all this stuff turned out to be extremely handy when it came to fighting uh, COVID-19. So um, what happened, and this is uh, uh, a little story from, from the real world, out of the blue on March 6th of this year, uh, the White House, um, not Donald Trump, God forbid, uh, but the Office of Science, Technology and Policy uh, contacted us through a colleague at Georgetown because we had all this infrastructure built up for processing scientific papers and said, could you put together all the COVID and COVID related papers in a machine readable form? so that AI systems and IR systems can operate on them and help uh, biologists and virologists make progress on this disease. And can you do it yesterday? Well, um, with, uh, within uh, a few days, we created what's called CORD19, which is a corpus of all the relevant papers where we could find. And we had uh, a number of journals and publishers uh, and preprint servers contribute their papers. And by uh, within a week, uh, CORD19 uh, was, uh, was ready. We had a lot of partners involved from uh, Chan Zuckerberg uh, to Microsoft and others, all helping uh, uh, to make this freely available resource. And on March 16th, 10 days later, we released it to the public. It initially had, um, this was the announcement from uh, the White House and it came uh, with a call to action to use this to answer questions about the disease. Initially had over 24,000 uh, research papers and we knew that it would grow rapidly. And in fact, uh, it has. At this point, it has more than 200,000 papers. It's updated daily, freely available to download from the Semantic Scholar website. Uh, not only are the papers machine readable, but we were also uh, able to process uh, tables automatically. And Kaggle joined us and created a, a competition where uh, various questions that were asked uh, were, were given to the Kaggle community to answer. And this became the most popular uh, Kaggle competition ever. The, uh, our data set was viewed more than 2 million times, downloaded more than 200,000 times, and uh, a bunch of uh, useful medical research came. We didn't come up with a vaccine or you would have heard about it, but uh, we helped contribute to the progress. A lot of different institutions, and I wanna highlight them, uh, have gotten involved in various ways, building tools uh, on top of this, uh, contributing uh, and so on. And, and let me just give you a, a, a few examples. I won't go through all the details. I just wanna give a few examples to give the flavor and then I wanna stop so we have a chance for uh, questions and discussion. So there's more than 50 uh, publicly available tools. There's search systems, question answering systems. For example, um, AWS fielded a CORD19 search system where you can ask how infectious is co uh, COVID-19 or much more technical. Are a IL-6 inhibitors key to COVID-19? I have no idea. Or you know, how does convalescent plasma therapy differ from a vaccination? All, all these questions. And what happens when you do that, and this is a snapshot actually from a system out of Korea University, it not only gives you the relevant uh, sentences and paragraphs and papers, but it'll highlight the answer. So what temperature kills HCOV-19? You can see it says here uh, 56 degrees, and it also uh, gets it wrong plenty, right? These are, uh, you know, we all know AI systems um, uh, very much work, work in progress. Uh, we've also done some work, this is in collaboration with colleagues in UW, on claim verification. So uh, if you make a claim, and uh, I, I have um, uh, some, some examples here to show you, um, uh, you know, like um, hypertension is a common 
comorbidity seen in COVID-19 patients. Again, it can show you whether uh, that's backed up by the research, by analyzing the tests. So for example, we asked it, and this is also a paper coming out in EMNLP, we asked it, does mass masking, or we put it as a claim, mass masking reduces COVID-19 transmission rate? And it pulled out uh, a research paper in support of this claim. And if you drill down, you see, well, the level of support is 98%, and it'll show you the supporting sentence uh, and, and paragraph, so you can verify for yourself. So uh, very, very helpful. We're now considering getting this a version of this uh, ready for the debates uh, coming up, the presidential debates. Um, anyway, I, that's a digression. Uh, another thing we've looked at, use of information vi visualization techniques, where we can show connections between uh, proteins and um, genes or proteins and cells, and again, help you slice and dice the literature uh, that way. That's a, a program that's on our site uh, called SciSight, and uh, you can play with that. It doesn't just do that. It also, here's, by the way, in the bottom left is the, uh, is the URL. Uh, and uh, it also allows you to do uh, facet navigation, looking at uh, topics and different research groups. Scientists told us that uh, th they, they wanted to know who's working on what. That uh, was actually very interesting to them. So uh, we look at connections between uh, groups. Uh, there's uh, green shows social affiliation, right? The same people are in these groups or uh, the purple shows topic affiliation groups in different places working on the same topic. So again, different ways to navigate the sociology of COVID science based on the information in, uh, in these papers. Really more generally, our goal was not just to have this be a basis for cool AI research, right? I showed you a bunch of papers coming out in EM and LP, but also to help the medical community. And so we were delighted to see this quote from a clinical researcher in Swedish, uh, where basically they said COVID-19 is an excellent proof of how uh, AI is helping helping in uh, in their research. And uh, we let, let, me, let me skip this or from Kaggle, but we were pleased to see that uh, there were there are a whole bunch of medical researcher medical papers coming out uh, based on COVID-19. Here are some examples from uh, journals or from preprint servers like MedArchive, and there's there's quite a few of these. And this really leads me to the punchline. And that is um, going all the way back to the fear of AI and the use of AI for the common good. Uh, I, I think that my colleague and friend, Eric Horvitz from Microsoft Research captures this really well. He said, it's not AI technologies that is gonna lead to the destruction of, of humanity, quite the opposite. It's the absence of AI technologies that's already uh, killing people. So uh, third leading cause of death in American hospitals is uh, physician error, right? The physicians are overworked and don't have access always to the best information. Systems like Semantic Scholar and AI systems in hospitals can help them. We could talk about self-driving cars where again, there's a potential to save a lot of lives. But my point is that for this pandemic, and certainly for the next one, we need to have cutting edge AI tools helping scientists and medical researchers uh, save us uh, from, from this, these uh, horrific viruses. So uh, we feel very proud that Semantic Scholar and COVID 19 in particular is part of that. And, and um, last slide, I wanna go back to the vision that led us to the um, inception of Semantic Scholar. And of course, we didn't invent this vision, right? The notion of AI helping scientific discovery goes uh, at least as far back as Herb Simon and uh, his work on that. But the modern version of this asks, what, what if the cure for an intractable cancer is hidden within the tedious reports and thousands of clinical studies? Can we use AI to help scientists uh, solve these problems? And even more broadly, can we use AI to help solve sciences thorniest problems, whether it's climate change, pandemics, uh, what have you. Uh, if we can do that, then uh, I will feel like we've made a real contribution uh, to AI for the common good and to humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk. Um, we'll uh, open the floor to questions. There's one in the chat already um, asking about um, 
how do we benefit from non-English data and articles? Um, so we have a constant list of uh, projects to uh, prioritize in uh, uh, Semantic Scholar. And one on the list, uh, for example, is uh, putting in uh, foreign language and using machine translation capabilities, both people who want to read English papers but don't speak English, and conversely, people who author things in other languages. Another one is helping low vision people um, access the information in figures, which is often very uh, opaque and difficult these days. Uh, and this just hasn't yet made it to, to the top. So um, great question. And we want to do that. Uh, we, uh, we're also a nonprofit with, with limited resources. Maybe I could ask a question next. So um, thank you. Excellent. I mean, always uh, so fascinating to hear from you and very uh, inspiring. So I wanted to go back to the, uh, you know, the first part of the talk where you, met, you know, AI as a tool and more and more sort of this idea that AI researchers need to understand the context in which it is applied and understand the, the implications of the use of this tool. And I've struggled with the question of, you know, how much do we need as, as individual researchers, we have limited resources. We can't sort of see the second and the third level implications of the work we do. Where does, uh, I guess I wanted to sort of hear from you roughly, you know, how much, because I, I may deploy a system, but I may not have seen the second level implication or third level, or, you know, the uh, NGO I'm working with does this other stuff on the side, which I'm not aware of, things like that. How much of it you see is um, our responsibility? Where do we draw the line or do we draw the line? Um, well, uh, you know, when you get started in, in your, your career, I think that you, in an academic career, you're incredibly motivated to uh, write uh, a paper and get it published. I still remember how much time and effort I put into my very first paper in 1988, and it's, it's embarrassing. It's a terrible paper. Please do not go look it up. Although if you do look it up, use Semantic Scholar. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, and then of course, you're very focused on the lines, right? You're like, I got a paper published and you try to figure out, okay, what's the taste of the community so I can get another paper published and I can get my CV to be longer uh, and longer. And then um, you start like guarding those things. You say, well, that paper, that doesn't deserve to be published. Let me be one of those strict reviewers that you know is really negative on papers. But then as you get older and you realize that publishing a paper is not the be all and end all, uh, having a positive impact on the world is the be all and end all. You start, I think a lot of people start to be less concerned with lines and when drawing lines and more concerned with the one line that matters, the bottom line, to riff on, on, on your phrase there, Milan. And so the bottom line is, can we help people? Can we make the world a better place? And the only distinctions and lines that matter are the ones that support that and the other ones we should put aside. So, Milan, I, I, I took kind of a roundabout route. Did I did I answer your question though? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I I understand the the impact of I mean of where you are going. I think what happens is that we, uh, you know, we have a very positive mindset in saying we really want to help the community and we're going to use AI and you know we, we can do due diligence on whatever we can because we have limited resources. We can only do so much. This NGO, whatever it is, we're going to go help them work. But then somebody else comes, well, did you know that they also do this other stuff? And, you know, and, and even though it could have happened without AI, you know, you, now that AI is involved, these people will come in and say, well, you know, you shouldn't have helped them because you've amplified their efforts uh, in doing this negative thing. Now, the point being that it seems to me that as, you know, it's like we as AI researchers uh, can only look so much. We can only do, do, and then at some point, our it would seem like our responsibility shouldn't be like to to see all the negative ways in which this partner can use the AI tool we built or something like that. But I, 
Right. So let, let me say something more directly about, about that particular issue. It sounds like you had some, uh, you know, negative experiences. You know, um, and let me put this in the context of some words from uh, President Obama, who really wrote just an absolutely brilliant piece about this in the context of talking about uh, a cancel culture and yelling. And again, um, uh, it really, really worth looking up because of course, of course, he can say things much better than I can, especially quoting him. But his point was that if we are so morally pure that uh, an NGO that's trying to help people doesn't meet our requirements, and an AI research group working with an NGO trying to help people doesn't meet our requirements, thank you for, for sharing that in the, in the chat. Really, if you, if you take one thing from my talk, take reading this, uh, this article. So... Uh, if we are so high and mighty and so pure and so, what's the word, picky, uh, then we're not going to have a real impact in the world. If we want to have a real impact in the world, we have to be willing to work with um, imperfect people and imperfect organizations and either have a positive impact to sway them to uh, our, our cause or have a positive impact despite the fact that, that they're not perfect. And I just think, so I try to take very much a utilitarian point of view. Am I overall having a positive impact? Not am I only holding hands, you see the holding hands thing with, uh, with the purest of the pure. So great point, um, great, point. great point, thank you. Yeah, and it's not mine, it's, it's um, again, President Obama's, but I, I sure do believe in it. Um, I'll ask a question about how these uh, essentially research support systems can work for uh, for for scientists who are say say working on COVID nineteen. Um, so, if you're active in some, you know, you're writing a, a paper on some particular COVID related topic, and you need it's either a review of some area or uh, you need to understand kind of the, 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 the breadth of evidence on a particular issue. Um, often the way I see that being done is, you know, I went to some big search engine and I typed in these keywords, right? And I identified 9,000 papers and I handed it off to a large number of people. And we looked at the abstracts and we identified this set as, um, this set is the, 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 the useful set of papers. And then we wrote summary statistics for them or that, that, that kind of approach. Um, it seems like that kind of work still needs to happen because it's sort of like the, where responsibility ends. You know, if you, this, this review paper becomes authoritative because it has done this, you know, incredibly extensive review and having an AI system kind of, uh, mediate that activity would be reduce the kind of authoritativeness of that, that result, because there is no person who picked through every single paper in literature. Um, how, is, how do you see, I mean, I, I guess uh, it seems like in, in some sense, people have to look at all, every critical paper in certain areas in order for science to work. But I see that there could be a, another kind of more intermediate level system where just being told about sal salient papers could be, could be useful. Do you, do you have thoughts on that, that kind of issue? Yeah, a, a, a lot of thoughts. And again, uh, it brings up so much. So if I didn't answer your specific question, please don't hesitate to, to point me back at it. The, the first point um, I want to make is that um, uh, AI is an exercise in humility in front of the human mind. So I very much view you know, semantic scholar and things like that as a tool to help you find papers and, and results and so on. But we always give you the provenance to check and we always encourage you to, to, to be careful, right? Uh, both uh, making sure that the AI is drawing the right conclusion and make sure that you didn't miss anything that way. But again, um, uh, we are missing. Right? We are doing needle in the haystack searches. We are reading, you know, uh, 10,000 papers in our career when there's, you know, 200 million papers uh, out there. So it's, it's the reality of it. 
one thing that we do try to worry about a lot is what's called the, the rich get richer phenomena, right? So with some of these uh, metrics and so on, you can uh, go to the popular papers, right? You can, uh, and, and you can go, okay, I'm gonna read the papers from Stanford and Harvard and, and miss the other ones. So again, there are various things in our algorithms to try to, to, to balance that. And of course, the thing you have to remember is like without, these kind of uh, search engines, and I say, oh, let me just look at Chris Manning's work. You know, sure, you know he's a uh, you know white guy at Stanford, but he does really good work. I'll just stick with his stuff, right? So, so, so I, I'm just saying we, we have to be very careful here. That said, uh, I do think that with proper verification and counterbalance and diversification, there's tremendous room for this because there's no other choice because of the of the numbers I I, uh, I cited earlier. But I, I do think that uh, I would, for the foreseeable future, not advocate a paper or result written by an AI system without very careful uh, human collaboration and corroboration. Andrew, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I guess I guess what I'm I'm getting is is kind of that you the it, this system is really helpful for finding things that you might not have been looking for, like. You might not have known that you're looking for, you know, your research feed is giving you papers and it tells you that there's somebody who's working on a similar topic who you never heard of, you know, in a, in a different community and maybe not so good at the area that you're, you know, really a deep specialist in, in your particular community that you'll, you know, that you'll have a better sense of who's working on, you know, this dimension of this particular problem, um, exhausted. Yeah. D don't mean to interrupt, but that's actually a very interesting empirical question because uh, sometimes we think we're experts in our field. I often find papers that I'd missed even in my sub area and I missed them because my heuristics are kind of selective. But I think uh, let's, let's leave that as an empirical question. I hope you try the tool and see if you find any papers in your area that you missed uh, or, or maybe not. I see Lisa has her hand up, please. Terrific. Uh, thanks very much. So I'm with the Canadian Medical Association. Definitely was looking forward to this uh, presentation today. So I was aware of CORD-19 way back, you know, I guess in April. Seems like longer ago than that, but back in April when, or, you know, at the beginning of all of this um, COVID. I'm wondering what your thoughts are around next steps. I think this is really intriguing, right, about drawing out um, articles that could be relevant, you know, for COVID. I fascinating, definitely interesting, but I'm trying to get a sense of where to next. So in particular, what I'm thinking about is um, like physician notes, you know, is there, so I'm thinking NLP, how, you know, where do I want to go next with that? Or where could one go next? Is that on your radar? And then even just anything around transcribing verbatims, even I'm thinking because we do surveys. So just even trying to get at verbatim. So I'm just wondering if that's anywhere you're heading or where are you heading? If well, you can tell us, uh, of course, of course. So again, as a, as a nonprofit, we're we're an open book. Um, the first thing is that, uh, and again, as you see, my pattern is to take these great questions, but try to put them in this broader context. So the broader context is that NLP, well, AI in general, but NLP in particular, is really experiencing uh, an inflection point due, due to these deep learning methods that. Uh, uh, some of us were skeptical of for many years, but have clearly made a, a, a huge, huge difference. And so uh, NLP's ability to um, uh, process text effectively has gone way up. And, and now uh, lots of people are working on different texts, including uh, physician notes, uh, electronic health records, uh, everything. And we actually have some startups in the incubator working on that. In our own project, uh, our focus is on the scientific literature uh, that's, pardon me, easier in, in a number of ways. And that's, you know, we can't do everything. So that's our focus. So we're not gonna go there, but other people are. And of course, connecting the dots between these uh, is, is a huge thing. Uh, HIPAA is, uh, you know, and Sun is obviously, the privacy constraints are obviously uh, an issue there. I see there's some question in the chat. Does somebody wanna read it, Andrew? Yeah, I can read it. Um, Ronan McGovern asks, how do we have a collective consciousness in this great work? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, mean, I, 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 I can explain a bit, Orrin, what I was thinking is over the summer, I did this independent entrepreneurial project based at the Stanford School of Entrepreneurial Studies. And 
so I built a team almost like between 90 and 100 people of all kinds of disciplines and work to produce a report on neurodiversity. And one of the things I found is, I suppose most, probably most people were in America and mostly in California. But what I found is that no matter what the discipline or no matter where people were coming from, including in Europe and around the world, is that there was an unspoken collective consciousness that fed into the work. And like, whilst we never really put it down on a tablet, but I suspect that where we all meet next week and say, listen, can we get down on paper what our operating principles have been over the last few months? That somehow or other, there was a kind of a gospel that was we were applying, even though it was never spoken. And my, kind of my question was, I was wondering, as a non-kind of AI specialist, in this work, is there any kind of collective consciousness amongst the people who work in this space in terms of what guides, what integrity principles guide the work? That was my question. Yeah. I think that is an absolutely fascinating topic and uh, not, not one that I've thought about and certainly not in those terms. Um, I would say that in the semantic scholar work, we've not addressed that. We're focused on more kind of the uh, building blocks that would feed into a study of that. But I would say that in the common sense uh, work, so this is the mosaic project led by uh, Professor Yejin Choi, who shares her time between UW and AI2. That's very much a, a topic. She is working with her team to unearth and make more explicit uh, these governing principles uh, starting more, again, not so much in science, starting more in a social context or in a physical context or these basic unsaid things that we all know, like a, a person is younger than their parents, or you can fit a, you know, uh, a coin is smaller than, you know, the planet Earth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But also uh, social things like here are things you do and here are things you don't do. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you call somebody at two o'clock in the morning, here's what might happen, right? So many things that we've just, uh, yeah. Uh, so very much, very early stages with that work. It's, it's great work, won the uh, best paper award, uh, AAAI uh, this year, if you want to look it up uh, just to get a sense of the work, but uh, very early stages. Maybe with that, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to keep going, but uh, I also know that you know spending hours on uh, Zoom meetings is uh, painful. Yeah, so I don't know. I think Millen has a cutoff uh, at at uh, noon, so or three, I guess. So we'll lose him. Um, if you uh, want to stick around and, and continue discussing with the audience, that would be awesome. I'm sure there are people who can stick so, around. And also, if you have a cutoff, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take off, but Oren, thank you so much. A wonderful presentation. Thank you for coming and visiting with us. And we will we'll love to have you in person, hopefully after, you know, this pandemic gets through, we get through the pandemic rather. Thank, you. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll take one more question if there is one. And then, yeah, I, I also uh, 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 need to go. I appreciate the, the applause uh, emojis. Um, and again, don't, don't feel like you have to also feel free to send me an email uh, if something comes up. But if there's one more question, very happy to take it. Otherwise, I'll stop. Uh, if no one else is jumping in, um, so one thing I was curious about is whether modern computer science, modern machine learning in particular, are presenting any particular challenges with this, given that the pace of our field is just moving so much more quickly than typical sciences um, or other fields in which things will sort of have a so slow process and then people cite each other after a few years whereas now people are citing there's like two whole chains of citations before the paper even gets published for example so are you specifically factoring that in well uh wow Th that is really a, again a fascinating topic for the field in a in a different way uh i would say that generally um, uh, the, the, the biggest trend is the fact, right, there's these preprint servers and they're very popular. Uh, and generally, I see that as quite a positive thing for the following reasons. First of all, it's open access. So I didn't get into just how much trouble we have accessing papers from 
uh, traditional publishers. It's an ongoing struggle. And so it's really nice to have these things uh, out there, have them available as much as possible. Secondly, one of my colleagues, Mark Neumann, recently published uh, the best rejected paper awards where uh, it's, uh, he showed papers that were rejected from, I think it was specifically from ICLR, a uh, very prestigious conference that garnered a very large number of citations showing that they were very uh, impactful. So there's kind of an alternative path not necessarily you know, fully systematized, but kind of people's choice through these preprint servers for people to discover papers uh, that have not been accepted for publication or before they've been accepted uh, for publication. I have not seen, uh, which is obviously a riskier work that's really shoddy or problematic in, in AI, uh, in, in my field, right? Uh, that has gotten a lot of attention that it shouldn't have. I'm sure that'll happen uh, sooner or later, right? There is kind of room for rigorous review. But what I've seen so far uh, is that that path has been uh, very positive. It's helped move the research forward uh, quickly and helped uh, in, in these ways that I described. Thank you, makes a lot of sense. Thank we'll you. Wrap up there. Thanks again for the great talk. Thanks to everyone for coming and uh, uh, participating in the discussion. Thank Thanks. you everybody. Take yeah. care. Uh, nice to, uh, to talk to you.